I will open my mouth in parables, things hidden since the world was made, I will announce. My, friend, my dear friends, we have the fulfillment of the gospel par parables, the mustard seed and the leaven in the good lives of the new Christians from St. Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians. St. Paul praises the faith of the Thessalonians. And you became imitators of us and of, our Lord, of the Lord, receiving the word in great tribulation with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that you became a pattern for all the believers in Macedonia in Achaia. In the gospel, we have a, the parable of the mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it grows, it is larger than any herb and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and dwell in its branches. And we also, Jesus also speaks of the parable of the leaven, which a woman took and buried in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. All these parables speak about the kingdom of God, the church upon earth, and how it will grow from the 12 apostles to the whole, throughout the whole world. The fruitful growth of the church among the pagan people throughout the preaching, through the preaching of St. Paul is evident in the epistle to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians became an example to all the other people. We thank God, St. Paul tells us, always for all of you when we make mention of you in our prayers and we unceasingly remember you, your active faith, your energetic charity, and your unwavering hope in our Lord Jesus Christ before the face of God our Father. The parable of the, most, the mustard seed is certainly an interesting one. The mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds, and it's un, in many ways, it's, it doesn't give any special taste or anything. Saint uh, Blessed uh, Cornelius Alapide tells us, at first glance, it seems, very, it seems small, worthless, despised, not marked by any flavor, not surrounded by any odor, nor giving any sign of sweetness. But once it is bruised, it sheds abroad its odor, displays its sharpness, and exhales nourishment on a fire, of a fiery taste. Thus too, the Christian faith at first sight appears small, worthless, frail, not manifesting its power, nor carrying any semblance of pride, nor conferring grace. But as soon as it begins to be bruised by diverse temptations, immediately manifests its vigor, indicates its sharpness, breathes the warmth of belief in the Lord, and is possessed of so great ardor of divine fire that both itself is hot and compels those who participate in the fer in, to be fervent also. As the two disciples said in the Holy Gospel when the Lord spoke of his pa after his passion, did not our hearts burn within by the way while the Lord opened to us the scriptures? So we see a grain of mustard seed then warms the inward members of our bodies but the power of faith burns up the sins of our heart. So this, our faith is like a mustard seed in a way. As the mustard seed burns us as we taste it, all of us have tasted mustard seed and it, British people here are very famous for their British mustard. I like American mustard myself and I never forget when I was a young boy, I went visiting to a neighbor and they made me a cheese sandwich and lo and behold, there was mustard on the cheese sandwich. I had never put mustard on cheese. And I'd said, wow, this is so delicious. So we just marvel, my dear friends. This is a, another indication of God's glory, how much he's given us. I don't think we think about it too much. We take a lot for granted. But God has given us so many wonderful things in our life. Here we have mustard, mustard seed. Other people have tomato ketchup and things like that, and so on. And these are wonderful things that God has given us to help us to 
enjoy our life a little better. And we know the mustard makes food taste a little better, just like wine and beer take, make food taste a little better. Gifts from God, beautiful, delicious, and we have to be very grateful and thankful for these wonderful things. We take so much for granted. And here we see the mustard seed is like faith in burning in our hearts. And that's what's going to happen to the Thessalonians. They're gonna have the faith of Jesus Christ burn in their hearts. And they're gonna permeate the whole of Macedonia and Achaia and thereabouts. And this is a wonderful teaching, how the parables show us the teachings of God and how the, the growth of the church will develop. And we see this with the, with the mustard seed. Continuing, continuing Cornelius Alapide, a grain of mustard then warms the inward members of our bodies, but the power of faith burns up the sins of our hearts. The one indeed, the mustard seed, takes away piercing cold, the other expels the devil's frost of transgressions. A grain of mustard, I say, purges away corporeal humors, but faith puts an end to the flux of lust. How important that is. Our faith, which is so powerful, like a mustard seed, burns up our lustful desires. And this is what we need to pray for, a greater faith, so that we will not be interested in the lustful desires of the heart, as Our Lady said at Fatima, and this is most important, I think, and I don't think we realize it, but most souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh. And as I tell you each week, what do we have in our world? We have all the sins of the flesh, all legalized, promoted, and so on. And the people want, the, they want everything they want. They want all the sexual pleasure they can have without any of the responsibility. And that's why abortion is such a terrible thing. Abortion, here God gives us the, the ability to procreate the most wonderful ability you could ever imagine. Husband and wife in marriage, procreating children. Just before mass, I came across a couple from here and their little son of a year and a half was gonna be two in February. And I remember when the mother told me that he, she was pregnant, she was so happy. And, and here we see this beautiful child running up and down the church. And just unbelievable how children are so wonderful. And yet we kill them, kill them in the womb. This is, this is unbelievable, my friends. And what's more so is the world promotes it. The Sodoms of the world promoting abortion in all the capitals, Paris, London, Washington, and so on all legalizing the killing of babies. And if you protest and if you say anything, you're the bad person. My dear friends, this is, this is why we need faith. We need the faith of the Catholic faith, the faith that the virtue that we have to help us to overcome these desires of lustful desires. And the, must, like the mustard seed, this will, our faith will, will be able to do this because God's faith is so strong and so powerful. As we see with Thess Thessalonians, they are overcome the idol worship and now are longing for the second coming of Christ. Continuing, a grain of mustard, I say, purges away corporeal humors, but faith puts an end to the flux of lust but the, by the one, medicine is gained for the head. But by faith, our spiritual head, Christ, the Lord, is often refreshed. Moreover, we enjoy the sacred odor of faith, according to the analogy of mustard seed. As the blessed apostle saith, we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God. We are a sweet odor of Christ unto God. And of course, this is, this is the odor of sanctity that we should have in our, in our lives, living good, holy lives. And we now have the parable of the, of the leaven. The parable of the leaven flows naturally from the parable of the mustard seed because as the church grows, so will its influence the whole world, just as the leaven, yeast, permeates the dough. Interesting, the, we see the three measures whether you know it or not, and many of you don't make bread, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't be aware of it. 
But three, three measures of, of flour will feed 18 people for five days. So we see a, a, certainly a, a very generous measure of flour here. And of course, this is what, what's going to happen with the, with the yeast. Jesus, who is the yeast of God, he will permeate the whole world and make it holy. Continuing, St. Ambrose tells us, therefore, if the Lord is wheat, as he himself says in John 24, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. That's not John 24, but that's John 6. Same idea. The Lord is the leaven too, since leaven is usually made up, made only of wheat and flour. Therefore, the Lord is rightly compared to leaven. For when he was in the form of man, made small by humility and despised by his weakness, he contained within himself such power of wisdom that the world itself could scarcely contain his doctrine. Just think about that, my friends. That's a beautiful analogy. Here we have Jesus Christ as the leaven. And what does Jesus Christ do? He's God, and he's going to permeate the whole world. He's going to save the whole world. He's going to make the whole world holy. God can do this, and he has done it. And it took three centuries, as we know, for the Romans to be conquered, and the Christians conquered it by their faith, right? The faith of, their must, of the mustard seed, as it were, and also the grace and leaven of Christ. This is an unbelievable aspect of history, how the Christians conquered Rome, despite the fact that they were killing them all the time. Now, they, I don't know exactly how many Roman martyrs I remember reading about. It. I thought it was 12 million, but I stand corrected. But certainly it's millions and millions of Christians that were killed for three centuries. And if you read the Roman martyrology, you read so many of them gave their lives heroically. And just the amount of suffering that they went through, right, being all kinds of devilish, that's what they are, satanic punishments, roasted on, green, on gridirons, thrown into the fire, decapitation, you name it. They couldn't, they, they exhausted themselves trying to persuade and put the fear of, Christ, of, of death in them. But the Christians withstood and boldly spoke out for Christ because they knew that giving their lives for Christ, they would die a martyr's death and go to heaven. This is what they lived for. They didn't live for this world. So it took three centuries, but it was done. It was just, it's just such a magnificent thing how Christ, permeating the whole world, permeate, giving them grace to all the martyrs so they could heroically, even young virgins, young girls, dying such terrible deaths, and they conquered Rome, continuing. His substance by his substance, right, he, must, he might place the yoke of his Holy Spirit upon all of them, that is, make all Christians to be what Christ is. So Christ, like leaven, is broken up and dissolved by his various sufferings and his moisture, that is, his precious blood, was poured out for our salvation, that it might, be by mingling itself with the whole human race, consolidate the race which lay scattered abroad. And this is what we have now, the Christian faith permeating. And were it not for the Protestant Reformation and a few other things, and the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and all the other things, we would be Christian today. But now we become so secular that so, people, so many people don't believe in God. We need, my dear friends, a great purification. We need to get back to God. And we need God to enlighten us. And as I say each week, this is what the message of Fatima was. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. In the end, after God chastises the world for all their sins, especially, as I mentioned, abortion, we will have the ear of peace. We will have the greatest ear the church has ever had. We will have the most saints and the greatest number of vocations. And as Sister Lucia said in her, in her memoirs, all will be Catholic. Everybody will be Catholic. After the purification, when the world sees what God does and how God is going to enlighten the world and, pur and purify the world, 
they will all become Catholic. Everybody. No more Muslims, Protestants, few Jews will be left around for the second coming, and that's when they'll convert. But for the most part, everybody will be Catholic because they will see the truth of God. God will reveal himself in mysterious ways, as I've already alluded to you, with the various, the illumination of conscience. And people will see their souls as God sees them and realize that they've offended God and hopefully they re will repent. Some, of course, may be so hard-hearted they may won't repent. But this is what we need, a purification. We need Jesus again to permeate the world and sanctify it with an odor of, sanct of, of, of sanctification. So, my dear friends, we see beautiful readings today, and what we need to do is learn from the early Christians in a way they're a reproach to us. Right? Don Geringer talks about the reproach that the Christians of, of earlier days are to us today. The praise which the apostle, St. Paul, gives to the Thessalonians for their fervor in the faith they had embraced confers a reproach to the Christians of our times. These neophytes of Thessalonica, who a short time before were worshipers of idols, had become so earnest in the practice of the Christian religion that even the apostle is filled with admiration. We are the descendants of the countless Christian ancestors. We received our re regeneration by baptism at our first coming into this world. We were taught the doctrine of Jesus Christ from earliest childhood. Yet our faith is not so strong, nor our lives so holy as were those of the early Christians. Their main occupation was serving the living and true God and waiting for the coming of their Savior. Our hope is precisely the same as that which made their hearts so fervent. How comes it, it that our faith is not like theirs in its generosity. We love this present life as though we had no firm conviction that it is to pass away. My dear friends, this is what the problem is. We love this life so much, and that's why God is going to purify us of this love. He's going to take this life away from us that we've known. That's what this pandemic is all about, and it's going to get worse. The struggle is going to get worse. We can see it happening already. Already we were talking about the pro-life movement in Poland, how many of the pro-aborts are persecuting the people over there because they want abortion. My dear friends, we cannot, that cannot be. God cannot allow that. We have to be purified of that. And that's why Don Prosper Garange tells us we love this present life as though we had no firm conviction that it is to pass away. My dear friends, this life is to pass, pass away very fast. And as we get older and older, and that's what old age is all about, all right? We, we grow up, we mature, we get old, we get gray, we get wrinkles, and we get arthritis, and we get all kinds of things. Because God is weaning us away from this world because he didn't make us for this world. He's made us for heaven, where eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it even entered the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. My dear friends, let us not love this life. This life is passing away. This life is nothing, as we say in the, in the, uh, the Salve Regina, Hail Holy Queen, but a veil of tears this is a veil of tears, my dear friends. But we long for the, the happiness of heaven, to be with God for all eternity, like the Thessalonians long for. They long for the second coming of Christ. And this is what we should be longing for, the second coming of Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ, and of course, our own death and our meeting of Jesus Christ and going to heaven. This is why we want to save our souls and save as many souls as we can. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? The whole world. People want to gain everything in this world. They want this and they want that. What does it profit you if you gain the whole world and then lose your soul for hell, in hell, for all eternity? We should think about that. And this should make us very fervent 
like the, the mustard seed, fervent to permeate the whole world and change the whole world and save as many souls as possible, especially in our family, our relatives, our friends, our co-workers. We need to pray and sacrifice, as Our Lady says, pray and sacrifice for many souls will go to hell because no one prays and sacrifices for them. This is why I tell you, you got to pray the rosary, the family rosary, and not just one rosary or one decade, that's okay, but that's nothing. If you've you got the right spirit, you're, you're gonna pray all three of them, morning, noon, and night, because the world needs it, you need it, I need it. You gotta pray even more, because we don't know, because this is getting, as I've already alluded to, this world is getting very, very critical and we don't know what's going to happen. They tell us that the tri tribulation and the chastisements will be unbelievable, unbelievable. Various visionaries have seen them and they just were aghast and they screamed and yelled and cried and, and say they just couldn't believe it, what's going to happen. And so my dear friends, this is down the road and that's why we need to get ready. God has to purify the world. And as Akita, as Akita says, fire will fall from heaven and two thirds of the world will be destroyed if men don't come back to God. I don't think we've come back to God. Our lady said that in 1973 and we've just gotten worse. I think the cup is overflown already and the chastisements are imminent and we need to be ready for it. We need to wake up wake up and I could say smell the mustard, <laughs> smell the coffee as we used to say in America. Wake up, it's time. Tell that to everybody. What do you do? Well, first thing you do is make a good confession, a good confession. Yesterday I asked two people who came in, to, two women who came in to light candles. I just asked them a matter of fact, I wasn't trying to be nice. Are you Catholic? They said, yes. I said, when was the last time you went to your confession? They looked at me with daggers. They wanted to kill me, I think. They, they just turned around and walked away. They didn't want to have anything to do with confession. Can you imagine that? That's why Padre Pio could say, foolish child, you don't realize how, how careless you are in not going to confession. Confession is the greatest gift we could ever have that God will wipe away our sins, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world will take away our sins. All we have to do is go make a good confession, tell him we're sorry, and he'll always forgive us. My dear friends, we need to pray for that and we need to tell people that, nothing to be afraid of. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. That's why I love what St. John the Baptist, when he first saw Jesus, called out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who can take away sin? Only God. That's why we need to go to confession and have faith in the sacraments of our church. All right? And tell people. And make sure that your children, your grandchildren, and everybody else you know, get to confession. Get to confession. Make a good confession. Make sure you're in the state of grace. Because... When the Lord comes, if we're not in the state of grace, my dear friends, we will lose our soul. If we're in mortal sin. How are you going to get rid of your mortal sins if you don't go to confession? And what about all these people who are not Catholics? How are they going to get rid of their mortal sin? Yes, you can have a perfect act of contrition where you're sorry for your sins because you love God, but that's not so easy. What the goodness that everybody could get that. God would forgive us, as the Lord said to Mary Magdalene, many sins are forgiven her because she has loved much. So love the Lord much, make a good confession, and get ready, my dear friends, because this world is passing away, the way we know it is passing away very fast. And another type, another aspect of the world, the purification is on its way, it's here, it's coming. May the Lord bless you.